In the far west of China, a monstrous crime is taking place. A massive internment camp for hundreds of thousands of Muslim citizens. It's very difficult to find a Uyghur person who doesn't have someone in their family who has disappeared. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. We're focusing on the world's biggest media market, China. Two reports, one on Xinjiang, what the media can report from there and what they cannot. And we take you to Guangzhou and inside the Southern Media Group, a once thriving journalistic enterprise up against new realities, political and economic. The Me Too campaign makes its mark in German media with an Egyptian angle. And the Weather Channel opens the visual floodgates on Hurricane Florence. We begin with a story coming out of China that Beijing clearly doesn't want out there. Reporting on it could mean a one-way ticket out of the country it already has for one foreign correspondent. And Chinese journalists have it worse. Threats, violence, in some cases, prison sentences. The story is the alleged mass incarceration of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim minorities, more than a million of them, in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And 23 million people there are now being tracked by a high-tech surveillance system. The Chinese media echo their government's security narrative on this, that the measures are necessary given separatist movements in the area prone to violence. And the terminology can be telling. What the international media call internment camps, forced indoctrination, the Chinese media describe as political education centers, counter-extremism training schools. Our starting point this week is the resource-rich, news-rich region of Xinjiang. It's not as though Xinjiang is a black hole for news. If it was, it would be a big one, since the region is twice the size of Germany. What Xinjiang is, is a black hole for a certain kind of news. The official narrative in, in Xinjiang has always been it was a backward, feudal region. And the Communist Party went in the 1950s and restructured both the social and economic hierarchies there. That has been a pretty ironclad narrative. In 2009, that changed a little bit. There were these deadly ethnic riots between Han Chinese, the majority ethnic population in China, and the Muslim Uyghurs. And several hundred people at least died, according to state media. That served as a psychological and legal justification for many of the security measures and surveillance measures that we see today. Satellite images prove Chinese government has built uh, hundreds, if not more, of detention camps, and all they're also expanding. And hundreds of thousands of people are there just uh, for being Uyghur, being Turkic, and being Muslim, not because they have committed any acts of violence or terrorism. The government has been very clear, uh, the Chinese government, and the way they see this. They perceive they have a problem that could also be a security threat. They believe that there are radical elements who have infiltrated the population and convinced people that they should uh, have an independent homeland. And this is this kind of separatism and also uh, <clears throat> uh, extremism. China's government has reason to be cautious over Xinjiang. Since the ethnically driven unrest that flared up in 2009, there has been periodic violence and bloodshed attributed to Uyghur movements, including one attack at the heart of the capital, Tiananmen Square. Beijing's response, however, putting a community of 11 million people under surveillance, incarcerating so many in the name of indoctrination, has been wildly disproportionate. China's government argues it's out to stop what it calls the three forces, separatism, extremism, and terrorism. And China's media apparatus has adopted that term, parroting it in the same unquestioning way much of the U.S. media did with the so-called war on terror. Beijing's man in Xinjiang, Chen Chuanguo, was made party boss there after having cut his teeth in another ethnic trouble spot, Tibet. He has adapted some of the security measures used in Tibet to Xinjiang, including a clear focus on surveillance and technology. 
Things like police checkpoints every few hundred meters, forcible checking of people's mobile phone devices, um, of their laptops, um, as well as surveillance by things like iris scans, facial recognition cameras, um, and DNA checks. You have many Uyghurs who are saying that they're simply being called in because they exchanged text messages or shared an email several years ago that contained religious, uh, religious content, and now they're being called into a re-education camp or being questioned at a detention camp for that. It's very small action. You can wander around some of the residential neighborhoods where Uyghur communities were once concentrated and find them to be completely deserted. There's no charges, no trial. Um, people just sort of disappear into these places for many months at a time and, and even longer. Mega Rajagopalan has her own story to tell. She is one of the very few foreign reporters who managed to get into Xinjiang to report on the situation there. Just weeks after her piece was published by BuzzFeed, she was expelled from the country. Chinese officials want to limit information and imagery coming out of the region. Controlling access is central to their strategy. But there are some cameras they cannot control, the ones in space. The satellite photos of the detention centers featured in the international media will not be seen on Chinese television. Domestic reporters there are tightly controlled. As a Uyghur journalist, Alim Setov reports on the story from Washington. He is the director of the U.S.-funded Radio Free Asia's Uyghur service. It is uh, obviously impossible for Uyghur reporters on the ground there to do any kind of uh, reporting on these issues because we have already reported ourselves that you know, Uyghur writers and uh, Uyghur scholars who in any way spoken out against China's repressive policies have been detaining these camps. But for Chinese journalists, uh, this is an extremely sensitive subject. They are required to follow the Chinese government's line. They have to repeat the same thing, so they cannot independently report on what is happening to the Uyghur people. So in the West, we expect the uh, press to be investigative, to, to show us all the holes in what is generally a democracy. But in China, it's very different. There's this close association between the press and the government, as seen through the eyes, I think, of the Chinese government. I mean, you can look at Chinese history over many, many centuries. Any time the, the center is not strong, you basically make fiefdoms out of you know, different parts of China. So they're determined that their press will not become something that divides the country. It needs to be something that unites it. Officially, it's the People's Republic of China, but the voice that matters more than any other belongs to President Xi Jinping. President Xi has had no qualms in telling Chinese journalists and the news outlets they work for that the media's ultimate loyalty must be to the state, not the story. And Beijing's interest in what happens in Xinjiang isn't just political, it's economic. The state lies in the pathway of the Belt and Road Initiative, a mammoth infrastructure and development project championed by President Xi to create a vast international trade network centered around China. Its location is very strategic because it sits between much of eastern China and the countries of Central Asia. And Xinjiang is home to about a fifth of China's total oil reserves. It's also the biggest producer of coal as a region. It's vitally, vitally important from an energy security perspective to China. And this explains this kind of obsessive desire for stability in that region with the cost of things like basic individual rights so as not to upset its economic development plans, both at home and abroad. Xi Jinping has been president for six years now. His burgeoning power and influence have been compared to Mao Zedong's, who once said, the role and power of newspapers consist in their ability to present the party's line, its specific policies, goals and work methods to the masses. Half a century later, in Xinjiang, for the media outlets that spread the word, those same rules still apply. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Tarek Nefa. 
Tarek, this past week, the German broadcaster Deutsche Welle confirmed that allegations of sexual harassment made against one of its employees had, quote, proven credible, unquote. The network did not name that employee. However, this story has generated a ton of interest. What can you tell us? Well, Richard, it's widely suspected that that employee is the Egyptian journalist and TV host Yosri Fouda, a face known to audiences across Egypt for his coverage of the 2011 revolution and critical reporting of the military. Fouda formerly worked for BBC Arabic and for this network at Jazeera and later for On TV in Egypt. He left the country and became the host of a show called The Fifth Estate on Deutsche Welle in 2016. And that's where the alleged sexual harassment is said to have taken place. Now, while Deutsche Welle didn't name Fouda in relation to this case, it did confirm to the Associated Press that he no longer works for them. What have we heard from Fouda himself on this? Before Deutsche Welle commented, Fouda posted on Facebook that the accusations were baseless slander and later that they were part of a smear campaign, which is perhaps a reference to where these allegations originated on the pages of a pro-government newspaper in Cairo, El Yomis Seber. But since then, we've obviously heard from Deutsche Welle that they consider the allegations credible, and also from one of the accusers, Delia Al-Fagrel, who wrote on Facebook that Fouda had harassed her at his home in Berlin in 2016. OK, moving on. This past week, one of the biggest names in U.S. publishing, Time magazine, was bought out. It joins a long list of struggling news outlets taken over by tech billionaires from the west coast of the U.S. What's in the deal? So the billionaires in question are Mark Benioff, CEO of Salesforce, and his wife, Lynn Benioff. And the price they paid was $190 million, which is actually a lot of money for a magazine that reportedly saw its subscriptions drop by around 25% in the last year. And as you said, Richard, this is part of a trend. Wealthy West Coast patrons throwing financial lifelines at big legacy media outlets. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos did that with The Washington Post in 2013. The Atlantic and the LA Times have also seen similar kinds of investments. OK, but let's look at the long term. What can these tech investors bring to help news outlets that are struggling to adapt to the digital age. The media executives tend to get very excited about these kinds of deals, and it's easy to see why. They represent a validation of their journalism, the print industry in general, and more importantly, they provide an injection of much-needed cash. For the buyers, there's the visibility and influence that comes with owning one of these historic print publications, even if they're not necessarily great investments. A more cynical take, of course, is that they're just vanity purchases, like buying a football team. But for the news industry, the bigger question is this. Given the broken business model, can print outlets survive without these benefactors? And the answer increasingly seems to be, no, they can't. OK, thanks, Tar. Back to China now. About six years ago, in 2012, we reported on what was an undercovered aspect of Chinese journalism, the rise of investigative news outlets. One of the organizations we looked at then was the Nanfang Media Group, or Southern Media Group, based in the city of Guangzhou. Publishing papers like the Southern Weekly, the Southern Metropolis Daily, and the 21st Century Business Herald, the group had a track record, investing in deeply reported, muckraking journalism that held Communist Party officials to account and even resulted in some political and legal reforms. That's not the case now. After a few serious run-ins with the authorities, Southern Media and its journalists have come under a kind of pressure that has severely handicapped investigative reporting. This is just one case in a landscape that has seen significant shifts. Greater state monitoring and control of media, as well as increased competition and falling advertising revenues, have all had an impact. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the decline of the Southern Media Group's investigative reporting efforts and what that says about journalism in China today. April 2003. The Southern Metropolis Daily, a paper published by the Guangzhou-based Southern Media Group, ran a report entitled Death of the Detained Sun Jigang. The story was about a young laborer picked up by police for not carrying his ID. 72 hours later, he was dead. The official explanation? A heart attack. The paper published the results of the autopsy that revealed the extensive beatings that had caused Sun Jigang's death. Fast forward to May 2008 and the earthquake in China's Sichuan province. Reporters from the Southern Weekly, another publication of the Southern Media Group, broke the story of faulty school construction that exponentially increased the number of dead. 
These were stories with real impact and the kind of journalism the Chinese rarely got to see. It was a charmed time for news reporters and consumers in the country. The 1990s and 2000s was the golden age of journalism, uh, investigative journalism in China. And the prime example of that golden age is the Southern Media Group. This particular media group has done really well in attracting wide readership, attracting advertising revenues, and becoming one of the prime examples of high-quality reporting that is also capable of making money in China. Two main issues emerged alongside China's social development in the 1990s. The first was police abuse of power, often resulting in violence or wrongful convictions. The second was government corruption. Southern Media Group, especially Southern Weekly, had many outstanding journalists well-versed in the methods of Western investigative journalism. Their reports on these subjects became the benchmark for Chinese media workers at the time. China's golden age of journalism was not to last. As the country approached a political milestone, the 2012 transition from Chairman Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, the censors swung back into action, and aggressively. For the Southern Weekly, New Year's Day 2013 marked an unprecedented moment in China's media history. That year, in its New Year's editorial, the paper called on the country's leaders to adhere to the principles in China's constitution. As it went to print, however, the editorial was pulled by state censors and replaced with a version in praise of the party and its newly anointed leader. Journalists at the weekly staged a walkout, the first of its kind in communist China. Hundreds of ordinary citizens would later join the protests in solidarity against the censors. Fang Kecheng was in the newsroom that day. The censors really stepped over the line. So uh, there's uh, so we posted this whole situation on social media and got a lot of supporters. There were a lot of protesters outside our headquarters in Guangzhou supporting us. Yellow chrysanthemums symbolizing the death of press freedom were laid outside the headquarters of the Southern Weekly newspaper in the city of Guangzhou. Foreign media uh, covered this incident and it really showed that this uh, newspaper, because of its uh, reputation during the last more than 20 years, it got a lot of uh, supporters in the society, both on social media and offline. The propaganda department of the Communist Party wants to exercise tight control over the media. Um, that became very, very clear uh, once Xi Jinping took over and declared which direction he was taking China. The Southern Group, particularly with the politically incorrect New Year editorial, would have been seen as essentially mounting a bit of a challenge. And that's simply completely not acceptable. And therefore, you will have to be make an example of, so that nobody else would dare to even think about copying what you have done. Through 2013 and after, the censorship of the Southern Media Group was taken to another level. Reporters were harassed, online content was ordered to be taken down, and publishing licenses were revoked. The end of 2015 marked a low point. The senior editor and former chairman of multiple Southern Media Group publications, Shen Hao, was sentenced to four years in prison on what many observers said were trumped-up extortion charges. Chang Ping, a deputy editor and news director at the Southern Media Group, was forced to leave China just before Xi Jinping's ascension to power. He has watched from the outside as the state's grip on media has tightened. Ever since the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, there have been certain boundaries the media are not able to cross. These include certain political topics, ethnic minority rights, national sovereignty, the military and religion. The political pressure placed on the Southern Media Group is part of a systematic process to control the media. In doing so, the party seeks to control every aspect, including its management, the publishing of reports, and even whom journalists can interview. Pressure is not necessarily always placed on individuals, but on the industry as a whole. Under this system, no media group, whether it's Southern Media Group, Tsai Jing, Peng Pai or Eastern Media Group can escape political pressure. However, it was never political pressure alone that pushed the Southern Media Group into decline. 
competition from online media resulted in plummeting ad revenues and stagnating media salaries. Many journalists left to work in business and tech startups across the country. The Southern Media Group's case isn't an isolated one. It's just one of the most prominent. Sun Yat-sen University recently published a report showing that across the media landscape, the number of investigative journalists has more than halved since 2011. For those who remain, doing investigative work involves navigating both the editorial red lines set in place by Beijing and the changing media market. Social media in China is very popular. Weibo and WeChat are very popular in China. So, and on Weibo and WeChat, you could open your own personal account. And some independent journalists just publish their independent uh, investigation. A independent journalist named Huang Xueqin, she published a, a piece about a sexual harassment case at Sun Yat-sen University in, in, in southern China. And it, uh, it was uh, hugely popular and influential. And uh, uh, just a few days after the publication, the university just fired that professor who was involved. Well, you still have some uh, very good uh, news media in China. We do see news media reporting on major corruption cases, for example. In the last year, the most senior case, a Politburo member who was being reported was that of Shen Zhengchai. Now, he could be reported because he was somebody that Xi Jinping wanted to make an example of. And therefore, journalists could report, but still, in fact, under fairly tight guidance from the propaganda department. Chinese media landscape and the relationship between the media and the state is ridden with many contradictions. We're seeing lack of investigations in some areas, but some investigations in others, and things changing um, on a very fluid basis and very quickly. That's why it's called a battlefield. It's not all, you know, won over. It's not completely controlled or figured out. Given the sheer number of voices in China's vast journalistic sphere, absolute government control has never been completely possible. What is undeniable, however, is that under Xi Jinping, the Chinese state's command of the media space has been consolidated and reinforced with dramatic repercussions for investigative work across the country. And finally, for all of the faults media critics find in broadcast journalism, it can still provide a vital service. When impending weather disasters like Hurricane Florence are heading for the eastern U.S., TV ratings skyrocket because the up-to-date information those networks provide can save lives, pure and simple. This past week, the Weather Channel rolled out some new mixed-reality technology using computer-generated imagery, CGI, to give viewers in the storm's path an idea of what kind of floodwaters the hurricane might produce. And for context, they used a 5-foot, 2-inch anchor woman as a measuring stick. The clip is as entertaining as it is informative, but news consumers could use more of this kind of reporting and less of those hapless correspondents getting lashed by wind and rain for the mere sake of being live on the scene. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. We could be talking about six to potentially nine feet of storm surge, given how that high tide comes in with that storm. But this is just what it looks like on the map. We can show you what this could look like if you were to find yourself in this scenario. Once that water comes up to three feet, you can see it would be coming up my shins, up towards my waist. This could be enough to knock you off your feet. It could even float some cars that could be parked on the side of the roadway. This is extremely dangerous, but once we get up into that six foot range, look at how high this water goes. Winds pick everything up. Cars would be floating at this point. This water's over my head. I wouldn't be able to stand here, even withstand the force of the water coming in. There might even be dangers like chemicals and uh, exposed power lines lurking in the water. But once we get to that nine foot range, this is an absolute life-threatening scenario. This water is through the first floor of your home into the second. You can see there's fish floating around in here. This is an extremely dangerous and life-threatening situation. So if you find yourself here, please get out. If you're told to go, you need to go. Listen to those local officials and make sure you heed the advice that's told to do so.